Man, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not backing off. I think that those readings were excellent. We got, did you know that reading from Isaiah on this mountain, I'll create a, a feast of well-aged wines. That's sometimes carved on the front of tables of altars because this is a foretaste of that feast to come. Then we have that Philippians text of like, what do we keep our focus on, on those things that are good, on those things. <sighs> Y'all, so good. All those readings are so good. And then we have this parable with weeping and gnashing of teeth and throwing somebody outside into the outer darkness. I struggle. Um, so we're continuing with this series of being reformed, uh, reforming our lives, right? Um, we're building towards Reformation Sunday, and we're from this tradition. If you don't know, as Lutherans, we came out of the, the Reformation, the Lutheran Reformation. We're actually called the church sometimes as a church, always reforming, because we're trying our best all the time to be the best reflection of Jesus. We're trying really hard that our ways, our words, and our works best reflect what it means to be Christ in the world. Um, so there's been a lot of change throughout the history of the church, but the one thing we kind of say gratefully is that the Spirit is still at work, Christ is still alive, and we are living out that good news, the same good news today and every day. Last week we talked about um, following Jesus will reform our sense of success, and Pastor Lorne brought up this story um, and also talked about what it means that we're a people who follow a, a resurrected God, uh, a God who was crucified. That kind of our understanding of success does not include somebody who is executed usually, but we do because triumph is found in the empty tomb. And this topic today is about reforming our sight. Following Jesus will reform our sight. And I think this parable is excellent because there are so many characters in this parable and there's a lot to look at. There's a lot to see, a lot of things competing for our attention and I think this story says something really profound about our attention, about our sight, and how we can see like Jesus. So today highlights that really well. The elites, we've heard this story, and I think a lot of us have heard this interpretation. I think it's a very solid one. The, we, let, let's go over the parable, because I'm a nerd who loves going over scriptures, and it's my favorite thing. So um, this parable starts with a king, right? The kingdom of God is like this king who throws a party for his son. We're like, oh, Jesus is the son. I get it. This is easy. This is going to be a really straightforward parable. And he goes, he throws a party and he invites all the, the folks and the yuckety yucks say, no thanks. We can make some connections to that. We're like, some people don't like this thing that God's offering. Some people who should like it don't. Cool. So we do that. And after those people say no, God does this really God-like thing and goes, I will send my troops and kill them all. Okay, that's a little challenging, but we'll continue. Then he invites to this banquet a bunch of slaves, good and bad. Anybody who comes, well, okay, we can start making this connection. Grace, right? God's love is for all people. This table is set for all people. Great. All people are invited to this banquet. So far, so good. But then somebody's not wearing wedding robes, it says. And that person who's not wearing wedding robes is a real piece of work to this king. And the king comes out and interrogates him and goes, what the heck are you doing here without wearing the right clothes? And he says, nothing. And he goes, him and throw them outside where there will be yeah. Jeez, now it's off again okay I can get the interpretation that God offers great things to all people but there are still some rules you got to follow so if you do those things maybe you'll be chosen or something because many are called many are called everyone's invited but, but few are chosen oh my gosh you guys are so good at this so I think we can understand that interpretation. I think that's really, really good and fair that God offers this to all people, but there's still some things you got to do. But um, that still sounds like that thing you learn when you're a kid, that like being good gets you stuff. You're supposed to behave, and then you'll be one of the chosen, which I get. 
But does anyone notice this doesn't sound at all like Jesus? Is anyone having a hard time with the weeping and gnashing of teeth, the binding, the, I'm sorry, the murdering, the heaps of people that are murdered? I, I, if you don't have trouble, I'm surprised, because that should be a little troubling. That God does this, that this character who oftentimes we attribute as God, the king does this terrible thing. And killing all these people and committing all these crimes, we're like, it just doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like the one that Jesus says, this is my father. Would you call someone father who's willing to do these terrible things to complete strangers? It's a hard one. So I want you to think of this story because this is about reforming our sight. I want you to hear this story again. But I want us to think about what's of premier importance. I just did this little sight misdirection to the kids. I don't want you guys to fall for misdirection. Listen to the story. Think of this story. And I want you to think about who Jesus is. What character in this story resembles Jesus? I'm a big nerd. I love biblical context of where the story was told. This parable would have been told to people that would have lived in a world. They would have had politics just like us. They would have had a world that they lived in, context that they lived in. And the idea that someone would reference a king and people wouldn't immediately think in that context of Herod is wild. They would immediately think of King Herod. Now, if you don't know, King Herod was one of these types of kings that was um, uh, loved by some, particularly Romans, particularly Roman sympathizers, because he was seen by the elites of Judaism as a puppet king, a fake king. So can you imagine this king going, I'm going to throw a huge banquet, huge. I'm going to get everything ready, and I'm going to bring all the yuckety yucks. Who would turn down such an invitation? People that think he's fake, phony. That's not a real king. So that's not surprising, actually, to hear this story, that the king would throw a party that a lot of people wouldn't go to. Another thing that's not surprising, if you were to think of a king, we hear this murder thing, and we're going, Bleh! but that's not new to Herod. Herod kills people all the time. In fact, Herod throws really lavish parties. Herod will kill people. Herod will murder his enemies. Herod is known as this guy who has uh, a Hasmonean coup organized against him. And he's like, I'm going to take this. He marries people off. He's all about politics and staying in his position of power. Does this sound like anybody from this story? It should. Anyone hearing this would have been like, yeah, I get that. Then this guy decides, in, in throwing this great party, after he's murdered a bunch of higher-ups, just grab anybody. Just bring anybody to this party. Bring anyone to the party, and uh, if you don't mind, dress them up, because I don't want to see them looking like peasants. So please, put them in their wedding robes. Robes would be offered to all people. Everyone go there. Behave appropriately. This is a wedding. We're supposed to celebrate! I know you're all servants, which means all of you have been greatly affected by me killing your masters. I've killed all the high ups. Forget about that. Have fun. Eat this fatted calf I've prepared. But one of them isn't playing along. One of them refuses to wear the robes. He's considered in that group as an outlier, an outlier, an outsider. He's not doing what he's supposed to do. There's expectations that you show up, have fun, wear the robes. And he doesn't. Is he reminding you of anybody? Then he's singled out. They're like, why the heck aren't you wearing your robes? Why aren't you doing the thing you're supposed to do? And he goes, does that sound like anybody? Remember when Jesus was arrested and they're like, hey, are you the Messiah? And Jesus is like, they say, he won't answer. He's quiet. So in his silence, the king gets mad and goes, you know what? I got nothing for you. Bind them up, throw them outside. Throw them outside where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's, again, that sounds like J-Man, doesn't it? J-Man doesn't answer. Jesus gets crucified. 
Not to mention, this parable is literally coming after the last parable where the one who was bound, thrown outside and killed was the son, was the son thrown out. And this son is the one, the stone, the builders rejected, but he has now become what? The cornerstone. How on earth are we supposed to interpret this reading except to say Jesus is obviously there. This is the kingdom vision. This is what happens. This is how the kingdom is unveiled through this king that throws this party and this person who won't play along. This person who knows the truth. There is an alternative story being told here. One of pain, suffering. This pageantry is built off the backs of people that have been hurt murdered, killed. This is a lie. And when you call it that, the liars are going to be upset. And the king is very upset and throws him out. Are we seeing something? I'll give you another example of a time when maybe there's something to be seen that's right there that we don't see. So my wife is a first grade teacher. Um, At this time in her career, she was a kindergarten teacher. And did you know kindergartners are tested? spouse bias, right? Um, So she's having to teach these kids that half of them are potty trained. Oh my gosh, kindergartners, are you kidding me? This is like herding cats. And they're preparing them for how you do reading comprehension assessments. What? So the way they prepare them is, I'm going to tell you a story. And then when you hear this story, I'm going to ask you some questions. And that'll that'll help us understand if you understand the story if you're listening, like what kind of comprehension you have. So I'm going to tell you guys a story and I want you guys to tell me the answers. Cool? You're like, oh no, pastor's going to trick us. I am. I'm going to trick you. Okay. So in this story that my wife read, it's this story about a little boy and this little boy is sad, really sad because this little boy is, has lost his dog. (laughs) Terrible. This boy is so sad. He goes, you know what? I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to go find a picture of this dog. I'm going to go find a picture of my dog, and I'm going to start making some flyers to put up. So he goes, and he finds the picture. He makes the flyers. It's all about the work of putting this together. And the boy puts up the flyers, and he's still sad because nobody's responding. And then at the end, great news. The dog returns. Happy ending. (laughs) So here's the quiz. Are we ready? Here's the quiz. Why is the boy sad? You would pass the test right away. One child goes, well, he has no friends. <laughs> You're right. There are no friends talked about in this story. And he goes, could be, let's just keep that train going. He could be an orphan. There's no parents in the story. To this child, the first thing you do if you lose your dog is you go directly to your parents or to the neighbor and go, I can't find my dog. But that's not what this child does. This child goes, oh no, I need to do this all by myself. I need to solve this problem through my dramatic action. Well, no, this a complete misunderstanding. This child is listening to the story and not hearing a protagonist and like a, a, a problem, a big rising action, a falling action, a climax. He's going, this poor orphan child has no friends. Because for him, he sees a person. He sees a person that's hurting. He sees a person that needs help and is getting no help. To him, why is the boy sad? Sure, the dog's missing, but really, he's alone, unbearably alone. If he'd write that down, he would have got it wrong, by the way. Sue Burkhoven knows, you'd get it wrong. There's nothing in there about him being alone. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, don't get me started, I'm sorry. I'm, that's a little side road on testing children. But anyways, <laughs> um... I think there's something really wild there that the kid has seen the same thing everyone else has seen, heard the same thing you all heard, and said something completely different. That's really wild and something we should think about how following Jesus would change how we see things too. Undoubtedly, it should change 
how we see things because Jesus is the suffering servant. Jesus is this lamb who is sacrificed. Jesus is this person who dines with sinners and tax collectors. Jesus is this person who hangs out with the marginalized of society. Jesus is seen by some people as not the right type of person. But he is our Lord and Savior. He is the light and the life. And that is good news for us. That should affect how we see the world. Like it did this child, right? His wasn't Jesus. His was about a person, which I would argue is very much Jesus-like. We have this really popular saying, what would Jesus do? But I think there's a really powerful question, do we see what Jesus sees? The world is full of trauma, violence, Right now in the Middle East, there's warfare, and a lot of times there's a lot of things competing for our attention. Death, violence, the struggle, the problems, what issue, what side of the issue are you on? I would ask, what would Jesus be looking at? Where would Jesus' sights be? On any person that's suffering. On any person that's been hurt. And how we, as believers, as followers of this kingdom come of a day where this table will be set for all people how are we a part of helping people being a balm to people who are suffering how do we change our vision from seeing kings and robes and things that are flashing and grab our attention and instead see the individual who has been singled out tossed out hurt where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth And how do we go to that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and offer love, help, provision, comfort? Because our eyes are on Jesus, right? That's where our eyes should be, is on our our king, around this prince of peace. Instead of seeing the people who are battered and hurt, we can be distracted. Let's keep our eyes instead on those that are suffering, not on kings or robes. I think if we do that, we keep our eyes on the same thing that Jesus would be looking at. And we will be blessed. Lord knows we will be blessed with an abundance of opportunity to serve our neighbors, to love our neighbors, to bless our neighbors. And for that, I say thanks be to God. Even in the midst of heartache, even in the midst of trauma, we have that ability to keep our eyes fixed on what's important what is good, what is noble, what is healing and helpful. Amen.